Good morning. Uh, I want to make sure before we start that you get an outline. Not all outlines were in the bulletin. That was my fault, not Kristen. So if you even see a typo, that's because I didn't have anyone else look over it. So uh, I was reflecting last night of how great it is that we've had two straight Sundays where we've had a Sunday on Christmas, and now we have Sunday on New Year's. I was one of the first people to kind of complain about it, but I think it's a great thing that we were able to actually celebrate um, the birth of Jesus on the 25th, but also start the new year right on January 1st. Um, and so I just think that's a great thing. So today's January 1st, and one of the things that always happened, and I saw it last night, people were already starting and they were talking about their New Year's resolutions. Well, today my message is going to be a New Year's resolution for you. But I want to explain what's up on the screen first. Plotline. This is the overarching theme of what I'm doing with our students on Wednesday nights. Looking at the main plot line of the Bible, of looking at the story of Jesus. But if you go to the next one, I'm going to be speaking to you, to you today on a part three of this series that I did with the students in November called Descendants. We went through the book of Genesis. Now we're going through the doctrines of God. We just finished the doctrines of God. We're in the doctrines of Jesus. And this new year we're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So we're going very deep with the students, but really trying to hit what they need to know, especially in this changing world. But I had told Brad, after I preached, uh, preached this message to our students on Wednesday night, I was like, hey, when you're ready for me to speak, I got one for you. And so he graciously allowed me to speak on January 1st. But what I'm going to do before I start is I'm going to pray, because I think that's how we need to start. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for a new year, God. God, I thank you for a new day of life, God, that we should not take for granted, God. I thank you for waking us up this morning. God, I pray that we would take this new year, God, not just looking at New Year's resolutions, God, but seeing how we can glorify you, how we can grow more in you, God. And I pray that you would give me the words to speak today. Amen. We're going to look at Genesis tw uh, 32. But what I'm going to start first is my message is titled, Clingy, Let Go to Hold On. That doesn't make sense, but it'll make sense as we go along because there is something that I'm going to challenge you to let go of so that you can hold on to God. So when we think of the word clingy, I thought of some things that may come to mind. We might think of relationships in high school and middle school. A lot of time, and even in college, they talk about a clingy person in a relationship. I think of Velcro, or I think of static cling after you get something out of a dryer, or even what's called a window cling that you put on your car. But what comes to mind for me is the next picture, water tubing. I think this picture is actually a little bit of false advertising because I've never seen somebody really on a water tube smiling, and I, it's usually an intense face. But if you've ever been around Lake, well, we're close to Lake Country, but if you've ever been on a lake, you will most likely always see somebody water tubing. But the thing is, why I call this false advertising? Because what usually happens is the next picture. <laughs> it starts off being awesome, water tubing. It's relaxed, you're having a fun time, it's chill. And then the fun turns into a matter of life and death. It's not fun anymore. You are no longer laughing and goofing around like you were before, and you end up clinging on for your very life. You get thrown around like a rag doll. You're going at high speeds. You have your driver possibly purposely trying to throw you off. You're getting air as you go over a wave. And if you hit the water... It could mean that you get injured, eye damage, or when I was little, you thought there might be a sea creature out there waiting to get you. And so if you were with me at camp, Brad remembers this, we had guys, we were riding this thing called a sombrero, and they were purposely trying to throw us off. And we were loving at first, joking around, but once they started throwing you off, you, were, you had that intense face and you did not want to let go. And I've been through a lot of different things, but... There's one specific thing I want to talk about 
is the next picture. This is called a banana boat. And this is also false advertising. I've never seen a guy over here on the bottom smiling and like he loves falling off. I've never seen someone love falling off. But why I have a little bit of issue when I go, when I've ever been on a banana boat or water tubing, one year at the camp I went to with our church, we went out to the Gulf Coast in Texas. And we were riding around on banana boats, and I'm waiting my turn because we have this line of students, and I'm on the dock, and you see them going out there. Next thing you know, you see the banana boat fall over. One cool thing about a banana boat, you can be on the front jumping up and down, and you can shoot the person off the back. Really cool. But we saw it flip over, and next thing we know, we hear people yelling and going crazy. I'm like, they just fell off. They're okay. Well, when they come back, they're like, you need to be careful next time you're out there. I was like, why? We just fell into a patch of jellyfish. Cabbage head, also known as cannonball jellyfish. So they were getting stung. These are not ones that have tentacles or whatever you want to call the stingers. They're small. You can pick them up in your hand. They're usually the ones that you find on the beach. And so when I was out there, all of us were like, we're not falling off. Everybody do exactly what you need to stay on because we are not falling off. And we were clinging on for our life because we did not know what was in that water. And so this can be similar to our life. I'm going to be talking about Jacob. And we will see that in his life he's going through the very same thing. He gets to a point where he is not only holding but clinging on for his dear life. And you can find the life of Jacob in the chapters 25 through 50 of Genesis. And your first blank is this, and his life could be summed up with one word, and that's wrestling. His life was like a lifelong wrestling match until one night when everything changed. From the beginning, Jacob is wrestling. You can read about all this in chapters 25 through 50, and all I'm about to tell you is true. If you look at his life, you will see that his brother Esau, he wrestled with him in the womb. They weren't just kicking like babies. It actually says in Scripture that it baffled their mother about the wrestling that was going on in her womb. When they were born, Jacob is literally grabbing onto his brother's heel. Jacob's name means supplanter or heel grabber. Years later, Jacob wrestles with his brother for not only the birthright, but also for the blessing of their father. Jacob wrestles with his uncle to marry the woman that he loves to not only find out that he marries the wrong one and has to wrestle not only seven years once, but seven years again for the woman he wants to be with. Also, Jacob's wives wrestle with, with each other over who he loves the most. And Jacob not only wrestled with his uncle, who was his father-in-law, once, but twice. Now, Jacob will be wrestling with, over to keep his wives, his children, and his possessions. Now, as Jacob returns home, he's been gone for a long period because he is afraid, after he stole the blessing and the birthright from his brother, who was ready to kill him, he's returning home. He's, ab he's afraid that he's about to face his biggest wrestling match. He's got to face his big brother. And he's thinking that it could cost him his life. But Jacob will find out, the next blank, that Jacob's, his greatest wrestling match will be with God himself. It won't be with his brother. It won't be with anything else he's faced in the life, but it'll be with God himself. And you may look at Jacob's life, and this may really resonate with you. You may be thinking that it resonates with you because you wrestle with a lot of things in your life. It could be school. It could be your family. It could be a job. It could be friends. It could be relationships. It can be struggles, pain, hardships, and everything else that goes along with it. And your life is a fight. You're always fighting for your way. You're fighting for protection, identity, and you may even be fighting to keep your name. And all of this is because a lot of emotions go on with this and we're completely exhausted. And you don't know what you can do because you're out of options and you're tired of going on. So I want to encourage you, the next point, go from a life of wrestling with Jesus to a life of resting in Jesus, because resting in Jesus is exhilarating. 
So let's see what Jacob did. Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22. So this is Jacob's heading home. He's got to the point where he's about to meet Esau. Esau has now, is now coming to him. Jacob's thinking, oh boy, my brother's about to kill me. So during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female slaves, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. Jacob was left alone. I'm going to stop there. So Jacob is now traveling back. The only problem is that he had to travel near where his brother lives. Jacob is afraid of the grudge that Esau has kept for years. He worked for Laban for a total for his wives for 14 years. There's no telling how much longer he did work. The scripture does not tell us, but at least 14 years his brother has kept a grudge of wanting to kill him. So if you go back and read, again, you'll see that Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob decides to divide his family into groups because he didn't want to lose everything he had. Everything he had earned. After everyone leaves, he is left to spend the night alone by himself. Now, why did Jacob do this? Why did he split his people up? He may have done this so that he could face Esau man to man, or because he knew that if he got him, that, that he got himself in his me, this mess, and it was his responsibility, or he wanted to take the punishment one on one and wanted no collateral damage for his family. But we, knew that, we do know that God ultimately led Jacob to do this so that he could wrestle with Jacob alone all night. It was time for God and Jacob to have their time. Because guess what? Why would God do this? When you are by yourself, that is when you are the most vulnerable. That is the time when you are most scared. That is the time when you're most afraid, is when you are by yourself. Is when, it is also the time when you will be the most transparent, the most honest, and the most of all, there will be no distractions when you're by yourself. You don't have family. You don't have other things going on. This is why God got Jacob to get by himself. So next. So Jacob is left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And he wrestled all night. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled, and he dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked, what is your name? Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Now Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, and I have been delivered. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel, limping because of his hip. That is why to this day the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is at the hip socket, because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the thigh muscle. Next we see that Jacob begins to wrestle with a man and it lasts all night long. This random guy comes out of nowhere. And that some people, some scholars believe that Jacob may have thought it was Esau. Some people think that. But if you know anything about wrestling, if you wrestled in high school, if you've ever wrestled your brother or sister or whatever, wrestling is exhausting. You can be completely tuckered out in less than five minutes. Well, and we're told in Scripture that Jacob wins the wrestling match. But we know that the man who Jacob was wrestling was obviously strong because all the man had to do was touch Jacob's hip to dislocate it. Let me ask you this, have you ever hurt your hip? The hip carries a lot of your strength. It is also a very important part of a wrestler's strength because it gives the wrestler his power. 
So the next blank is Jacob goes from wrestling to clinging. Is that, that wasn't right. Yeah, that was right. Jacob goes from wrestling to clinging. He goes to, from wrestling with this man to holding on to this man. He is doing this for one reason and one only reason, because he wants to be blessed by God. Notice that the man Jacob is wrestling with did not want to be seen, because this wasn't just a random guy. This man is God himself, and Jacob could not look on his face or he would die. And so what does Jacob do? He holds on as tight as possible. During their wrestling match, it must have become clear over time to Jacob that, oh shoot, I'm not just wrestling my brother. I'm not just wrestling this random guy. I'm wrestling with God himself. So why else would Jacob have asked this man to bless him? There's no other reason Please bless me, unless he had figured out it was God. And the man, God, asked Jacob his name even though he knows. If this is God and God knows everything, why does he ask Jacob, what is your name? Because Jacob is identifying himself. By saying, this is my life, this is who I am. Remember, his name means supplanter. His name means heel grabber. Basically what he's saying, I am Jacob. This is my life. I have spent my entire life trying to be better, trying to be greater, and trying to bless myself. And I need you because I can't get what I need by myself. He had to identify himself. All of us have to do this in our relationship with God. At, and I would say not only over one point, but we constantly remember, this is who I was. This is who I am. This is Stephen. I am claiming who I am. I'm taking responsibility for who I am. It's not only what my name, name means, but this is what I've done in my life. But the thing is, God was not looking to hurt or defeat Jacob. God, this is a blank, God in his grace came to wrestle with Jacob to get his attention. And guess what? God does the same with us. God will often weaken us where we are trying to wrestle him the most. Whether it is a secret sin or something else in our life where we're holding on to that more than we are to God and we're trusting that more than God. And so the next blank is God weakened Jacob to get him to submit. God had to weaken Jacob to get his attention. God took his strength. Everything he had used to gain all of his possessions, all of his power, everything he had in his life, God took away what he held on to most, and it was his power, his strength. What area in your life would God weaken you to get your attention? I often see this in young people. Next, the next picture. Relationships. This is a common type engagement picture. But I see this in young people with relationships. They're so consumed with the idea of being in a relationship and having someone because everyone else does. They're scared and afraid because they're going to end up alone, and if they don't find someone, they're going to turn into an old maid with a bunch, with a bunch of cats, and they're 16. When I was in high school, I remember there was a good friend of mine, and she was ninth or 10th grade, and she was so concerned with having a boyfriend because she thought if she didn't have one then, she would never find a husband. She was in ninth or 10th grade. But the thing is, it's not only restricted to young people. It can happen to people in college, especially as you're in college and you're seeing all your friends around you getting engaged and married. As Ashley and I were saying the other day, we're looking in December, we're like, oh man, everybody's getting engaged and married. All of our friends. 
And so they get consumed with this idea of being in a relationship, and it makes me wonder sometimes why people jump from relationship to relationship to relationship, because maybe God is trying to get their attention and removing something out of their life to get them, hey, focus on me, trust in me, get your relationship right with me instead of trying to find it in somebody else. Because if you don't believe it, young people, and not only young people, sometimes find their security solely in a relationship. But with someone that can never fulfill them and never give them purpose. So why does Jacob need this blessing? Because he knows what his life is. He's a deceiver. He is a liar. And he's on the run. Jacob knows that he needs God. Because the covenant blessing that his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac received has been driving him his whole life. He's heard his whole life. This is what Abraham was blessed. This is what Abraham was given. This is what my father was given. Isaac. But the next blank is Jacob knows that his only chance is being blessed by God. Because guess what? His life seemed blessed. Because everything he had already had going for himself, everything he gained, his possessions, he has a huge family. But the thing is, he is exhausted. He's tired and he is completely worn out. And being blessed by God is the only hope for his life to amount to anything good, worthy, and purposeful in his life. Because he's come to realize, if I don't have God in my life, I have nothing. Jacob knew that everything he had pursued was, was enough. One, sorry. Jacob knew that, that everything he had pursued was enough only until he finally noticed that he got everything with, when he got his relationship with God. So what Jacob had to do is he had to let go of everything in his life that he had earned and worked for that gave him worth so he could hang on to God and basically say, God, this is who I am. This is me, Jacob. This is everything I've ever done. This is everything I have, but I'm going to let go so I can hold on to you. That's the whole idea of being clingy, letting go to hold on. Because sometimes we try to take everything that we have and bring it with us and try to hold on to God. But it doesn't work that way. It's a great man who's no longer living. His name is Rich Mullins, who I greatly look up to with how he lived his life. He wrote the song, Awesome God, and many other songs that many of us know. He had this quote that said, I hope in the course of your life you encounter him. But let me warn you, you need to hang on for dear life or let go for dear life is maybe is better. This whole life, the whole idea of not just hanging on to God, but what, he's, what Rich Mullins is saying here, which is the same thing going on in Jacob, I'm holding on to everything else in my life. But I need to let go of everything in dear, uh, for dear life so I can hold on to God. Amen. So Jacob goes from wrestling to refusing to let God Go. He's no longer wrestling with him over power and possessions and his strength, but is literally holding on like a little boy would to his father. Or as Brad and I heard the other day about a, a, a soldier coming home, and you can think of when they're coming into the airport and they haven't seen their kids after a while, and a little kid comes and runs and grabs on. But hold on, I've got something to illustrate this. Over the summer, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet. So, this video that you kind of got a glimpse of. During the Tennessee wildfires, there was this video that came out that um, a lot of people have seen. I don't know if you've seen it. But these people rescued this little bear from the fire. And I want you to see what this bear does. Go ahead. Keep watching. Watch. Okay. 
to Megan. You can stop it. You can stop it, Megan. <coughs> Just clear the video. Yeah. <laughs> and so this whole idea of this bear, I saw this video, I was like, oh my gosh. It's a great idea of what we need to do to God. Of this bear saved from this, these wildfires in Tennessee, and literally when he meets his Savior, he won't let go. When the, when the person rips the bear off his leg, the bear keeps chasing him and wants to hold on to him. So the next blank is hold on to God and his promises. Similar to Jacob, God will come and personally step into your life and get your attention to help you move from a life of wrestling against God to a life of blessing with him. God desires to have a relationship with you. And did you know that even Jesus had struggling and wrestling in his life? Jesus wrestled with the tempter Satan, and he walked away pure. Over Jesus' ministry, Jesus wrestled with his own people, the Jews, over whether he was the Messiah or not. He wrestled with his own family that doubted him. He wrestled with the people from his own town that didn't believe who he was. He even wrestled with his disciples a couple of times. And he continued to preach the gospel. And Jesus' greatest wrestling match came in the garden with his own father before he went to the cross. Jesus begged for God to go about his purpose in another way, but Jesus went willingly. He fully submitted and he held on to God's promise for his own praise and glory. And the next blank is, a win came, what came from what seemed like a loss. Jesus died, but it was a win. And Jacob... Going back to Jacob, Jacob was going through a pivotal point in his life. He's transitioning into his own faith in God. Brad and I have talked about Jacob a couple times, and this is where both of us believe where Jacob finally got saved. And so must all of us have a point where we get saved. Because guess what? You need to learn to think for yourself rather than just repeat answers and verses. There's a lot of good Christians good Christians who can repeat verses and repeat answers and give the God answer, but have never fully submitted to God. Don't just come to church and go through the, emotion, the emotions. You have to grow up at some point and stop playing around and don't just go with it. But let me ask you this, why not now? Why not today? Because you need to have a desire to worship Jesus. You need to have a desire to have a relationship with Jesus. You need to have a desire to pray. You need to have a desire to obey God and follow him. Because guess what? No one should have to tell you to do this because otherwise this faith that you say is yours is not your own. Many so-called Christians have failed in this area because they have dropped the ball. Did you know this is even the purpose of why Brad even started D-groups? You see, Jacob had come to understand that the promise that was made to his grandfather Abraham and received by his father Isaac was now passed on to him. And we need to be willing to take on Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. John 15, 4 through 8. Do I have? Yeah, I do. Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. This is where Jacob was. I can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Jacob asked for God's blessing. My father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. This is where Jacob is finally getting to. I have to remain in God. I have to be this branch that is attached to him because my life is worthless. My life is nothing without him. 
The next blank is our blessings don't just come from Jesus, but are in Jesus through a relationship with him. Jesus himself is our blessing. It's just like the branches in those verse. For us to succeed and do well in our walk with Jesus, we need to believe the truth. We need to defend the truth. We need to think according to the truth. We need to live by it and wrestle for the cause of truth, study it, and discuss it. By believing in the promise, Jacob was actually clinging on to Christ. Did you know that? Even though Jacob did not know what was to come, the promise ultimately that was coming, this blessing that was coming, was Jesus. This is the plot line of the Bible. The plot line of the Bible is Jesus. He worshipped Jesus because you can't worship God without worshipping Jesus. And so what my challenge is for you for this New Year's resolution is hold on to Jesus or cling on to Jesus. Remember, Jesus is God and has always existed Jacob's life was changed. His identity was changed. His title, his name went from Jacob to Israel. And even Jacob's future was changed. God changed his name, which gave him purpose. Jacob was probably trying to get rid of his label and title that people had given him his whole life. He had to walk around and say Jacob, and immediately those people know what that means. Have you ever been given a title? Have you ever been given a name? And the thing is, we try to do the same thing in our life, trying to get rid of what everyone has ever called us, whatever title that people have made for us. God came to him, to Jacob, even though he was a sinner. Jacob didn't have to have everything right, but God intervened in his life at at the most opportune moment. Maybe today you've come to the decision that you need to follow Jesus. And you say, I want, to cl- I want that. I want to cling to him. I want to rest in him and no longer wrestle with him and make your faith your own. People, people all over the world are tired and exhausted because they have been wrestling and fighting with God because they think they know better and don't want to follow his imp- plan and embrace their true identity. The thing is, God out of of his grace and love comes to wrestle with us to help us rest, rest in him. But I say this, if you are a follower of Christ, what do you need to do today? As, you, as we start this new year on January 1st, a most opportune time to get things right. You have things in your life where it's all around you and you have to be like Jacob and say, God, I surrender to you. I'm going to let it all go. This is who I am. This is my past. And say, here, I'm going to take who I am and be responsible for it, but I'm going to give it all to you because you can give me a new plan in the future and bless me. Because we constantly need to do that in our life. I'm going to close. And if you are wanting this relationship with Jesus, I'm going to say a prayer that you can repeat in your heart. And you can respond to that. But I, again, challenge believers. What do you need to do? So I'm going to say this, as soon as I say amen, don't wait to do something. If it's somebody you have to talk to, if, it's, if you have to pray and say, God, this is who I am. This is me, Stephen. Take a hold of me so I can cling on and let go of everything else. So I'm going to pray. If you want a relationship with Jesus, you can say this prayer. This prayer doesn't change you, but it's what's going on in your heart. And you decide, God, I want a relationship with you. Lord Jesus.